what is Warhammer 40k? Let's watch this now, shall we? Now that I know a little bit more about Warhammer 40k, the first ever Warhammer video that I reacted to was Bricky's video. I kid you not, that was the first ever Warhammer video I reacted to, was Bricky explaining the different factions in Warhammer 40k. I know a bit more now, so let's see, shall we? In the grim darkness of the 41st millennium exists the Empire of Man, a backwards carcass of an empire comprised of many devoted forces. Gigantic robot knights, religious machine cultists, and incredibly heavily armored women, most likely with sweltering abs. And one must know what those abs taste like. <laughs> Oh shit, here we go. <laughs> My gamer sups flavor is here. Sweet nice. six pack has arrived. A delicious and refreshing cherry pineapple blend. Play the sound. Ah. Yes, my <laughs> Bricky's official gamer subs flavor is here. Sweet six pack, not only in regular energy mode, but also in caffeine free. The cherry pineapple flavor is not the kind of flavor that just smacks you in the face. It is light, it is refreshing, and it's one of those things where you sip it and you go, not bad. And next thing you know, you are having your fourth refill the same day. And it is available now. Link in the description. Use code BRICKY for 10% off your entire order. Not just for this, but for everything you buy. And I'm... I genuinely... Nothing against BRICKY here. Get your bag, it's fine. I don't know how healthy it is. For us to be pushing, like every company is doing this now, pushing the energy drinks on a community that is famously incredibly fucking stationary. So you're filling your body up with all of this excess energy that your body is quite literally not fucking using because you're not moving. You're, you're just sitting down doing nothing. I genuinely wonder what the hell's gonna happen. Because it takes a while before, you know, problems start to show up. But this seems, it's one of the reasons I will never accept an energy sponsorship. Because it, it just feels like scumbag marketing or scumbag companies marketing to an audience that, a product that that audience like literally doesn't fucking need. That's, that's what it feels like to me. I'm not dumb. If you buy any of these tubs, regular cap- It would be like a condom company starting to market to nuns and monks. It's effectively what these energy companies are doing. They're selling a product to a group of people that genuinely do not need this product. But then they also sell it in such a way that they convince that audience that, hey, you need this and there's nothing wrong with this. Caffeine free of my sweet six pack flavor, you will get a Muscle Girl 32 ounce shaker completely for free. There are only a couple thousand of those shakers, so get it while supplies last. I cannot believe we finally have this, but I I, I would like that shaker though. That's a cool fucking shaker. I don't care about the energy shit, but that shaker is pretty cool. I told everyone, like, once you find out the flavor, you'll be like, yeah, that tracks. And damn straight does it track. Sweet six pack available now. Code Bricky, link in the description. <sighs> I think, Praetorican, that is actually starting to change. A lot of gamers are starting the age to go more of knowledge and enlightenment the German has chef. ended. The age of darkness has begun. Roughly 60 million years ago, there existed aliens. And these aliens lived short, 
painful lives. They belonged to radiation-stricken worlds and often died of various cancers before the age of 30. These aliens, the Necron Tier, looked up to the stars and found extreme beings of real power. Beings with the ability to create life the Old Ones of the Galaxy. They asked uh -huh. these Old Ones for help. Please cure us of our ailments. To which the Old Ones said, piss off. So the Necron tier like gathered together and did the sensible thing. They declared war upon these old beings and were promptly beaten into the dirt back to their short, painful lives. Jesus. In the world of Warhammer, there is a hell. This hell is not like you and I know it. It's more of an afterlife, a place where dead souls end up. This place has many names, the Empyrean, the Sea of Souls, the Immaterium, and the Aether, but mostly we just call it the Warp. While you and I know of Hell as a place of horrors and punishment, the Warp isn't really that, not in the beginning. It's energy, but the kind of energy formed from thought and soul, psychic energy, where the dead souls of people end up in a place that is impossible to understand. No laws of reality exist. Like time is merely a suggestion and it is not something that can be braved easily. The warp would be like sailing well, the ocean in a pirate. I think the warp was fine until the war in heaven, no? Like before that, I think you could actually sail the warp fairly unencumbered with not too many issues. I know this is what is Warhammer 40k, so it's probably meant for very new viewers, which I get, right? It's probably best not to confuse them with immediate War in Heaven references, but yeah, the warp originally was a pretty fine place. Nothing wrong with going there. Uh, until, of course, the War in Heaven and the uh, Chaos Gods were born. That's when things really, I think, took off. It was easier to navigate, but not safe. Well, I what I mean with safe is much safer than what it was now. If you had a void ship with a, a galler shield around it, you were pretty much fine. Like, not much was going to happen to you inside the warp. Like, yeah, you could probably not go into the warp unprotected. But as long as you had your protections, you would be mostly fine, I think. Movie. To jump from your ship would be yeah. certain death. To stay in the sea for too long on your boat could drive a man mad. And there are many dangerous things lurking in those depths. Yet, the sea is not evil. It simply mm -hmm. is. Yeah. Mostly. There are more malevolent beings in those waters, areas that you do not sail towards. This would be known as the realm of chaos. The realm of chaos exists in the warp as a special area led by three chaos gods. Korn, the god of combat, murder, and slaughter, with a pile of skulls taken in his name. Zinch, god of change, mystery, and deceit, a confusing paradox of lies, schemes, and sorceries. And Nurgle, god of rot, pestilence, and Genshin impact. All things <laughs> rot in the end. And Grandfather Nurgle is waiting for you with open arms. <laughs> These gods ruled their respective realm in the warp, sending their many followers against cool. each other in the great game to be the most powerful of all the gods. So the warp exists. Um, I think so, Nyora. I don't think the Chaos Gods were created due to the war in heaven, but I think the Chaos Gods were corrupted due to the war in heaven. We watched a video that sort of explained this, but I can't exactly remember. But the Chaos Gods weren't actually the... Well, what we would consider to be evil beings until the War in Heaven. Because the War in Heaven basically fed so much fucking chaos and evil into the warp, the Chaos Gods themselves became what was being fed into the warp, at least. Hell is real, parallel to our galaxy, with the realm of chaos and its gods fighting for control. But there are also gods of real space, gods of the normal world too. They're called Catan, and they eat stars. You think- Of course they do. God stays in heaven because 
he too lives in fear of what he's created? These star gods saw the plight of our poor Necron Tyr and how the old ones cast them aside and said, you know what? You guys want immortality? Oh, we will make it happen. We are the gods of the tangible, of real space. We can nice give guys. you a cure. So then they ate all their souls. <laughs> and turn them into robotic automaton, feasting on their souls and leaving a, a hollow shell of an intelligence left that is technically immortal. With the power uh -huh. of an entire species souls, they turned their new robotic slaves on the old ones and hunted them to extinction. The Necron tier, now the soulless undying Necrons, got their wish at the price of their souls. But we can, count the number of kind okay. gods on an amputation. There's no way. I can't put my camera anywhere where it doesn't cover Bricky to some extent. He just moves around way too fucking much. I apologize, Bricky. I, I mean, sometimes my camera is going to be in front of you, but there's no fucking way I can stick this out. I'm not going to move the camera around the whole fucking time. So, yeah. Sorry about this, bro. <laughs> hand. With time, the selfish star gods turned on each other, fighting one another for more chances at glory and power. With this, the leader of the Necrons, Zarek, the Silent King, the man who- Can I just quickly ask, is he called the Silent King because he never speaks, or is there another reason why he's called the Silent King? Is it deeper than that, or is it just the case that he never makes a fucking sound? They weren't mean to talk in front of anyone? No, it was the title from the Necron Tier. I don't... Okay, they spoke via their advisors, either side known as the Triarch. Oh, shit, so it's very similar to Wheel of Time and the people from the desert, who their advisors speak for them. They don't speak. Okay, that makes sense doomed his species when he accepted this deal, waited, planned, bide his time until he seized the perfect moment and turned his legions of undead citizens against the star gods. Gods cannot be killed, but they can be broken. So Zarek broke the star gods into thousands of pieces and locked them away in vaults, taking their free will away as they did to them and sealed them away as Basically Pokemon to be used as weapons in the future. Who's that? So here's a question. Do you think the day will come when the Catan actually break free? Because the Necrons managed to break free from the control of the of the Catan. They already have a few times. What happens when one of these Catan break free? I'm assuming it's pretty difficult to put them back in their box. They splinter them into shards to minimize power. More shards together, more powerful they are. Ooh. So that is a book that I need to read. A book where they actually managed to break free. Pokemon! It's Pikachu! It's the Void Dragon! Zarek then, with his perfect memory, exiled himself for his sins, flying out to the darkness between galaxies to atone for what he had done. This entire situation, the genocide of the Old Ones and the rebellion of Zarek will go down in history as the War in Heaven. It is yep. the most brutal war the galaxy has ever seen and ever will see. This was a conflict that took an entire galaxy-spanning species and pitted them against gods that ate stars. The Necrons, rather crippled from, you know, the War in Heaven, decide to go to sleep in gigantic tomb worlds on various planets until the upstart species of the galaxy died out. And so turns out when you have a war that lasts tens, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of years and yeah. involves the genociding of multiple species, the old ones of the galaxy and the consumption of souls from an entire race, the warp gets a little wacky. You know, yeah. if you had a kiddie pool and it was nice and calm, corn is over there splashing about, so you don't really go in that direction. Nurgle has explosive diarrhea, so you don't really go in that direction either, but you can still kind of 
get in the pool. The pool's still fine. Turns out when you add a couple trillion souls to that kiddie pool, it'll make the waves a little more turbulent. And turns out a lot of them like to pick a side, Nurgle, Zinch, or Corn. So the once calmer warp, the once relaxing kiddie pool has now been bloated. A million years yep. of war <laughs> will certainly make Corn, god of murder and slaughter, more powerful. A million years yeah. of war will probably make Zinch, god of deception and change, a little more powerful. And good god, a million years of war will make Nurgle, god of decay, oh just the tiniest bit more powerful. Now entering that kiddie pool is no longer fun, it's dangerous. The warp yep. is now a problem. Hell is resembling hell a lot closer to what we imagined it originally. The sea of souls and the realm of chaos are now intertwined. So who else to brave the galaxy Ooh. than a species that won't need to deal with that? The Eldar are space elves. They have a lot of the traits that you probably think of when you think of elves. Tall, slender, pointy ears, a bit more androgynous looking, no matter what DeviantArt will tell you, and a bit stronger on, on the <laughs> emotional side. The old ones, as I mentioned, could create life. And when they were getting, you know, absolutely bodied by the Catan and the Necrons, they made some new races to try to help them. <laughs> One of them was the Eldar. It didn't save them, but they're here now anyway. Oh, and also the orcs, but uh, they're busy right now. <laughs> the Eldar are a particularly psychically powerful race. So they were really adept at being able to handle the new turbulent warp of chaos and good at killing Necrons, hence why they went to sleep. Being psychically gifted is basically like being a wizard, but you get your wizard powers from hell. This is called being a psyker. And basically, if you want to do cool wizard shit like lightning from your hands or reading someone's mind, you can do that, but you siphon the energy to do that from the warp. Luckily, uh -huh. the Eldar are very good at handling this without too many negative effects because, you know, summoning power from the Sea of Souls with the new Chaos Friends can be a bit of an issue, but Eldar are pretty good at it. And you see what's really cool and also awful about Warhammer is that most developed species travel long, faster than light distances by going through that warp. They create a tear in reality to unreality and move through it. Faster than light travel? <laughs> Cringe. We go through hell itself to deliver your packages. <laughs> For those of you who play Minecraft, you know how the- I would- Dude, I, I'm watching this and I'm thinking to myself, if you're a person that's never heard of Warhammer 40k, like, how bonkers does all of this seem? Like, to me now that know a, a lot more than what I used to know, I'm listening to this and it makes perfect sense to me. I, I fully follow it. It makes sense. Why not? But imagine you never heard of Warhammer 40k. You're watching this video for the first time. It, it's like, what? What is this guy even fucking talking about? <laughs> The nether is like a pocket dimension. So moving 10 spaces in the nether is actually moving something like a thousand in the real world. That's basically mm -hmm. what warp travel is. Just much like in the nether, there are a lot of things that want to kill you. The Eldar found a way to do so in between realities. Not regular reality, not the warp, something else. A purgatory of sorts, a fabricated psychic realm that allowed them to travel without fearing the negative effects of the warp. The Eldar were the perfect fit for the new galaxy, and they took it with open arms and pointy ears. The empire of the Eldar spread everywhere, and it spread all the way until now the 21st century. That's right, while you were watching NPC streams on TikTok, the space elves were ruling the galaxy and they did so for quite a long period. What if they are now, but they just don't bother with us because we're not a problem yet? What if Warhammer 40k is actually given to us by some alien race to prepare us for what is to come? Of time. Friend. 
The 21st century <laughs> came and went. Humanity grew and grew all under the nose of their elf overlords. At this time, humans advanced your classic sci-fi style way. We began to expand, colonize our solar system, terraformed our planets, created new and more powerful machines and starships. The age of Terra, also known as Earth, but we call it Terra here, was here and existed between the 21st century all the way until the 15th millennia. Not much is known about this time, not much needs to be known. Humanity grew up, sought the stars. It's classic. Then came the years between 15,000 and 25,000, the age of technology, or to some, at? the dark age of technology. This is when humanity reached a new apex of technological understanding. When you think of sci-fi, this is where you become proud of being human. Because this was the age where we kicked the shit out of everyone in the fucking galaxy, bro. There's a lot of things you can think of. Star Trek, maybe Star Wars style. You can go cyberpunk dystopian. The age of technology was deep sci-fi, like a scientific prowess that fringed on magic. This is also when the first ever psychers began showing up in humanity. Individuals with the genetic mutation to be able to access the warp and then because of that, travel through it. Humanity was no longer constricted to their early ways of travel. With warp travel, they could go anywhere in the galaxy. They equipped ships with gigantic AI machines with everything you would ever need to know about mankind and sent them out on colony ships to expand their influence across the galaxy. And this, this was truly the golden age of humanity. And with every golden age, there is a fall. While the new human upstarts of the galaxy were reaching new levels of technology and prowess, the Eldar were engaging in debauchery. 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 What happens? Yep. When a species has everything, you can produce unlimited food out of nothing. Your need for farmers and workers, gone. You have dominated the stars and have created a fast travel system that doesn't rely on the dangers of the warp. You have nothing else to do. You have no struggles, no problems, and feel as if there is nowhere else to go. Well, you begin to experiment. The Eldar started Why harmless not? enough. You know, you, you take a serious interest in your species culture, your, your arts, paintings, poems, plays. These are Eldar, elves, remember? Their, their emotions are heightened, more powerful than us humans. So your plays get louder. They start to push on, on the limits of your hearing ability. Your music becomes different, more deranged. It pushes the boundaries of what is art. The visual spectacle of art becomes more bizarre, more delusional, more eccentric. And let's not forget a very important sense. Touch. Pornography is one thing. I'm a virgin. Brothels is another. What if they all mixed? What if your brothels were part of your art and music? And what if those huh? became more deranged? The Sounds boundaries like of debauchery were not just met, but shattered. Next thing you know, murder is commonplace and often mixed with the art, music, and sex. Pain is a common byproduct of entertainment. <laughs> Whatever sensation you can have must be increased, must be enhanced, must be taken to the limits. The Eldar Empire slipped into a nightmarish realm of debauchery and excess, with the worst of it taking place in a city in the webway, a black market for these Kamara. kinds of heinous acts known as Kamara. Some Eldar saw the writing on the wall, saw what was happening to their species and how far they had slipped. So they boarded continent-sized starships called craft worlds and left their empire, seeking a more enlightened, calmer existence among their peers. Some, those in Kamara, pushed it to even greater heights, relishing yeah. the pain and torment they inflicted on those around them. All during this, the warp, the yin to the yang of the world was- I, I think I, I, he's probably sort of dialing it back for a lot of people that might be new. So if you're watching this as the first time ever, allow me to paint a little bit of a darker picture. If you were at war with the Dark Aldor as a human, and you had the option between being taken prisoner or having a cannonball shot right up your ass out your mouth and dying a horrid painful death while you're left on the battlefield, 
you would take the cannonball up the asshole. That is how bad it was being caught by the Eldar. Because they would quite literally skin you alive, and then once you've been skinned, they'll fuck you to death. Out of every orifice that can possibly take a penis. Ears, nose, mouth, they'll cut off your nose in order to increase the hole size. They don't give a fuck. They would do it because, effectively, they were trying to increase their experiences. That, that's it. That's all they really cared about was increasing their experience. They were evil. Beyond evil. Fed, fed by these emotions, by the psychic power of the Eldar, by the souls taken in these depraved acts on a galactic scale. And just like that, Eldar ended. Slanesh, the fourth chaos god, yep. was birthed into existence That's and consumed the right souls of 90% of the Eldar. Wait, 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 wait. Is this video actually being fucking monetized? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think you're allowed to show that on YouTube, but all right. Eldar population. Those that fled were spared the worst of it, and those in the webway in Kamara were able to stave off the pull of Slanesh so long as they continued to commit horrid acts <laughs> of torture and violence. But for the majority of the Eldar, their empire died with Slanesh's birth. The new fourth chaos god, she who thirsts, the god of unspeakable excess of pleasure, pain, hedonism, and perfection had been born. With the fall of the Eldar Empire came the ruin of humanity. Slanesh- Uh, Valen, yes, so Slanesh is mostly referred to as she, but Slanesh is sort of not just a she. Slanesh is both, male and female, depending on, right? Uh, so can appear as both, can appear as neither, depending on what the fuck the needs are of Slanesh. All you have to know is it is basically every single bad element of humanity dialed up to a million. That's Lanesh. Lanesh's birth sent storms in the warp across the galaxy, making travel between star systems impossible. Coupled with a huge classic AI rebellion, as a staple in these sci-fi settings, humanity yep. began to suffer the age of strife. Now, planets that relied on intergalactic travel were completely cut off. Long-range messages normally sent through the warp were snuffed out. If you were a planet that was great at mining stuff but couldn't get food, well, you know that movie about the rugby players in the mountains? Oh, and because of these insane warp storms and fluctuations, psychers began to appear among the human population a bit more often. Now, this initially had them hunted down as witches, because that's pretty common in this setting, but some deemed it right to protect them. Unfortunately for those people, psychers, because they open a gateway to the warp, don't really know how to use their powers well, and they kind of attract demons who then of force course. their way through the psyker as a conduit of sorts and begin to slaughter the population of your planet. The age of strife was a catastrophic period of time for humanity and set back their progress tenfold over the not one, not two, but 5,000 year period. During this time, the age of humanity that we know began to form. Worlds equipped with large mechs for agriculture began to equip them with weapons to defend from alien and demonic invaders. Over 5,000 years, this became a custom and tradition, dubbing them as Night Worlds, a feudal society of honor-bound knights in oh. gigantic robots that uphold the chivalric code to defend their worlds and honor. A group this of individuals on Mars after... This radioactively bombing their planet to become inhospitable to human life, ran their entire lives underground on the few life support systems keeping them alive. Those technicians who could work on the machines and keep them operational were revered, and over 5,000 years went from skilled members of society to full-blown priests. The cult mechanicus, or tech priests of Mars, formed in the ashes of the Red Planet with a religious fervor and doctrine on the cult of the machine god. And on Earth, or Terra, techno-barbarian no. tribes waged war across the planet in a Mad Max style of blood and gore. Until finally, 
a mysterious man who lived in the shadows of Terra for millennia for finally Emperor. revealed himself to the populace. His name was the Emperor. He deemed himself the Emperor Ooh, yeah. of mankind. Where did he come from? I don't know. Why is he 10 feet tall and the most powerful psyker of all of mankind? I don't know. Why is he basically immortal? I don't know. Where'd Cotton Eye Joe go? Who knows? But he's here, and he isn't happy with all of you ripping up Terra. So he began the Unification Wars, where he- So again, if this is your first time watching this, let's just, let's just put a couple of things here. Um, there's plenty of rumors, and you can probably go look them up, but there are plenty of rumors for where the Emperor actually comes from. The, the, the one we know is that the Emperor most likely has been around since the dawn of mankind, but he has spent most of his life watching and learning and waiting. Basically, he finally stepped in to save humanity when humanity was on the verge of tearing itself apart. That's when he eventually made himself known, but he was through all of our strifes, all of our good shit, bad shit. He was there and he was learning and he was plotting and he was planning. Uh, we know that he's a perpetual. So what that means is he can't die. If he were to die, he would just be reborn again. But that's effectively the only thing. I know I heard a rumor that the Emperor has died before and has lived many different lives. But I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't think that happened. I, I think the Emperor has just been waiting and sort of watching in the background, not seeing the need to interfere until such time that humanity was advanced enough to where he could ultimately enact his plan of the Imperium of Man, but was also on the verge of basically destroying itself. Uh, the Shaman one I've heard as well disbanded, where he was actually the result of a bunch of shamans. Uh, I've heard that one as well. And a very early version of the famous Space Marines, the Thunder Warriors, reunited Terra under a single banner with blood. Then, after Close. taking over Earth, he reunited the Thunder Warriors into the fucking dirt. This is where we True. get the Imperium of Man, also known as the Imperium. The new faction headed by the Emperor of Mankind with a treaty signed with the cult Mac This is also the only faction worth playing as or believing in if you are a loyal human. If you are not a loyal human, may death visit your door soon for the Emperor. Mechanicus on Mars to spread out and reunite humanity after the catastrophic Age of Strife. But first, the Emperor is going to need some smaller versions of himself. 20 of them. 18 of them, I meant. Gene-crafted sons of the strongest human to ever live. All of them possess unparalleled strategic power, intelligence, formidable strength and size. A real powerful force to unite humanity and stop the chaos of the current galaxy. Speaking of chaos, you ever seen that image of that guy? It's like throwing the baby like a basketball. It's about what happens. The chaos gods intervened and grabbed the 18 Primarch gestation pods and yeeted them across the galaxy at a whim, everywhere they could possibly go. A galactic game of keep away. So the emperor had to get them back. So begins the Great Crusade. A crusade across the stars to reunite not just humanity, but the emperor. I feel like I have to fill in the gaps here because we, we're we bound to have a bunch of viewers that's never seen anything about Warhammer 40k watch this for the first time. There are actually 20 Primarchs. He said just 18 that was taken and thrown out. There are actually eight, uh, 20, but we don't know what happened to two of them, right? So two of them are just gone. Uh, all records of their existence have been completely removed. Except when you speak to Ultramarines. So the Ultramarines apparently have information on at least one of the two disappearing Primarchs. However, they never speak about it. I'm not talking about the Primaris Ultramarines, I'm talking about the Ultramarines. They refuse to speak about it, they refuse to mention anything about it. It might be more than just the Ultramarines, maybe all of the Space Marines know, but they do know. Uh, about one at least of the missing Primarchs as well as the missing uh, Primarchs <clears throat> legions. Now, the reason, gameplay reason, 
for why these two Primarchs are missing is to ensure that people can create their own Primarchs as well as their own Space Marines. It's literally meant to be tabletop stuff. So if you want to play a tabletop game, but you want to create a Space Marine Legion or an army that isn't in the lore, you can create literally whatever you want and you can say that it is one of the two missing ones. That's why. That's why they've done it. So a nice bit of thinking to give people creative freedom to pretty much create whatever the fuck they want. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to make sense because those two are gone. It's not confirmed that they're dead. It's not confirmed that they have no legions. The only thing we know is that they were never codified by the emperor as his sons. The emperor never claimed them as his sons. But outside of that, nothing makes fucking sense, right? Emperor with his fallen sons. The first to be found was Horus. One of the strongest and most noble sons. The Emperor carried with him a legion of newly crafted warriors with genetic material made from their Primarch father. These are the newly made Space Marines. Marines. For Horus, his were the Luna Wolves. And as the Emperor continued on his great crusade, he found more and more of his sons, reuniting them with their individual Space Marine legions. Lehman Russ, the uh, Praetorical, you think one sabbatical year? Okay, people in chat that know stuff about Warhammer. Do you think Praetorican could learn everything there is to learn about Warhammer 40k in a single year? You might know some things. Like, maybe if you chose... Like, one faction. So let's say, for example, you wanted to know everything there was to know about the Eldar. Maybe a year would be enough. Or maybe you want to learn everything there is to know about the Imperium. Maybe a year would be enough. That would still leave a lot of the lore not explained or not known because there's too much. But the whole fucking universe? <laughs> Fuck no, there's no chance, bro. <laughs> a year is not enough. I think you could go your whole life basically reading every single book and you would still not know everything. It is giant. Like, this universe is... It's nuts. So, in terms of books, just books, we're not even talking source books or rule books or anything like that. We're just talking the books. There are currently, I believe, what is it? Almost 70 Horus Heresy books? The Horus Heresy, which is a single event that took place. It's an event that took place, has over 60 books just telling the story of that single event. All of the books so far, right, uh, that tells the story of the, of the universe is over 400 books of just the whole universe so far, and it's not done. Because the books don't follow in chronological order. They bring out books that deal with earlier times. They bring out books that deal with later times. A lot of the Horus Heresy books, for example, is in the 31st millennia. Uh, but then the Dark Imperium books, for example, here is in the 41st millennia. So it sort of jumps between times. It's too much. There's no fucking chance. One year is not enough. Not enough. The Cunning Hunter with the Space Wolves. Rogel Dorm, the Phalanx with the Imperial Fists. Angron, the Barbarian, the Very Angry with his World Eaters. Fulgrim, the Perfect with his Emperor's Children. And Jagatai Khan, the Swift, the Stoic, and his White Scars. Those were just some of the 18, and one by one his lost Primarch sons were returned to him, and their Space Marine Legions returned to them. The Great Crusade saw humanity once again reconquer the stars, yep. returning worlds of humanity back to the Imperium and killing any and all who stood against their noble crusade. But in the years of the 31st millennia, treachery would break this all apart. Men, we don't know what we did. Horus, the Emperor's most beloved and favored sons, named War Master for the Crusade, succumbed to the power of chaos and daddy issues, all because of that bastard Erebus 
Yo, fuck Erebus. Slowly, Horus would become corrupted, turning the Emperor's sons against him. This yeah. begins the most pivotal moment in our story, and the one that has like 50 books written about it, the Horus Heresy. Half. Nine of the 18 Primarchs turned against the Emperor, and the following years were a bloody battle for the throne of Terra. The Emperor Again, to be fair here, some of the sons that turned against the Emperor didn't know that they turned against the Emperor until it was too late to really return to the Imperium. Like, Horus and the Chaos Gods played it fucking perfectly. When you really go through that lore, they managed to turn legions, like, for example, the Word Bearers, who would ultimately... I mean, they believe the Emperor was a god, so turning against... They managed to turn everyone by just being completely fucking subversant and... Yeah, making it sound... Or making it seem like you were actually doing the wrong thing while you were actually doing the right thing. And also just, yeah, completely playing people. So, Mag I think it's Magnus. Magnus is one of those that... He would never have turned against the Emperor... But they managed to lie to... Who did they send to go fight Magnus again? Um, was it Rogel Dawn? Russ. It was Russ. So Russ was sent to go collect Magnus and bring Magnus back to Terra to answer for the bullshit that he pulled. But then the message that was relayed to Russ was kill Magnus. That's not what the Emperor wanted. The Emperor wanted Magnus to come back so that the Emperor could basically tell him, what the fuck, bro? You just destroyed my entire project? But because of how the Legion and the Chaos worked, Russ thought, well, let's go kill. Because that's what he's been told. And when Magnus realized that Russ came to kill him, it was like he had nowhere else to turn. Like, what was he supposed to do? His own family wants to kill him. So yeah, it was. It, it's actually a sad story when you go through some of those uh, traitor marines or the traitor storylines, how they were basically duped into becoming Chaos. Emperor originally was working on a special webway project, just like the Eldar, to make faster than light travel significantly easier and safer. Really improve humanity to allow them to conquer the stars without the risk of the warp. Well, this big red idiot named Magnus kind of blew a hole into that. Literally and figuratively. So Big E over there is stuck on a gigantic golden throne, holding yeah. back the oncoming rush of demons and powering the Astronomicon. Basically a big north star for people who are sailing in the warp to help them navigate. The Horus yeah. Heresy saw many loyalist and traitor legions pitted against each other in a bloody war until it reached Terra itself. Horus unable to break through the lines and with time running out made a gambit and opened his ship up to be boarded the emperor took this challenge quickly allowing someone else to take control of the throne as he teleported his way onto horus's flagship the vengeful spirit the emperor wait are we just skipping over uh the dude that took the throne oh, what's his name again oh we watched the video on him just the other fucking day Malkador. That's the one. Thank you, Disbanded. Yes. Dude, even if it is for newbies, Malkador's story is important. Like, it's important for newbies to understand just how cool Malkador's story is. So Malkador sat on the throne. The power of the throne so fucking vast that it literally destroyed him atom by atom. And by the time the emperor came, or by the time they placed the emperor on the throne, Malkador was no fucking more. Like, he was just completely torn apart. Like, it is nuts, dude. <laughs> Unable to truly kill his most beloved son, changed his mind right quick when Horus strangled the life out of his other son, Sanguinius. Oh, no! Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've seen this image at some point. The Emperor then said, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, and proceeded to psychically blast Horus into complete oblivion, killing not only his body, but also his soul. 
Horribly wounded from this duel, the Emperor is returned to the Golden Throne in order to keep the demons at bay and power the Astronomicon, because without it, humanity would be flying blind. There he sits, slowly dying from his wounds and yeah. the strain of powering the Golden Throne. The only thing keeping him alive is feeding upon the souls of 1,000 psychers every single day. This it's more now. was 10,000 years ago. We are now in the 41st millennium, modern day. Warhammer 40,000. Oh yeah, yeah bitch. Yeah. The Emperor remains on his throne. The Imperium is a rotting carcass of an empire, a fascist, xenophobic cult that worships the Emperor as a deity despite him never wanting to be seen as a god. Over the span of the one Emperor. million worlds, the Ecclesiarchy, the Church, of the Emperor is spread throughout. Inquisitors with unparalleled power root out any sign of heresy or lack of devotion to their god emperor. The other half of the traitor legions move about as chaos space marines, raiding and pillaging the Imperium while the loyalist half does their best to keep the Empire alive. All throughout this, they must endure orc invasions, Eldar trickery, the reawakening of the Necron race, and the Great Devourer. The new tyranid threat from the darkness between galaxies that oh, has arrived fuck. to feast on their imagine at this point you start explaining the tyranids to a newbie like fuck. if all of this shit in the galaxy wasn't bad enough we now have a visitor from outside of the galaxy which there may be more there may not be for those of you that don't know, we can't actually leave the galaxy. Like, we've done the whole galaxy thing. That's our thing, right? But there are monsters that sort of outside of our galaxy that would completely fucking ruin your day if you even went near them. Uh, there's two specific parts in our galaxy that no one wants to go to. Can't remember the names now. But it's like areas in the galaxy that is nuts because of the creatures that exist there or at least exist close to the boundaries of our galaxy and now the Tyranid threat shows up if you thought warhammer can't get more worry congratulations their worlds the ghoul stars that's the one hippo the theme of warhammer 40,000 is regression and intolerance. Every yep. major faction in Warhammer has had an empire that spanned the galaxy only to be crushed back to a hollow shell of what they once were due to their own failings. Culture, the arts, personal freedom, religious tolerance, the simple possibility that alien life might not want to kill us is considered heretical and is often met with a pistol to the head. There is no time. Yeah. For these things all there is time for is worship of the god let me just put something into perspective you can be a loyal soldier and still get a pistol to the head simply because your commander is trying to motivate the other soldiers in your company that is how bad shit is like you literally have commanders that will kill a soldier to motivate the other soldiers to fight harder. <laughs> that, that, that is how fucked up it is to live in the 40, 41st millennia. Emperor and a million wars to be fought. To be a human in the 41st millennia is 99% of the time to live a horrible existence. To yep. be one of trillions of other humans across a million worlds throughout the galaxy. A galaxy where AI is outlawed so humans are repurposed and lobotomized to become slaves. A place where lack of devotion is met with death. And if you even have devotion, there is a good chance the threats to the galaxy, chaos, and aliens will kill you anyway. Warhammer is a world where you revel in being bad. There are protagonists, there are antagonists, but every faction is some shade of evil. Because playing the bad guys is always more fun. And my friend, you have a selection. So pick up that last gun soldier you and the other you see i would say the thing that makes warmer 40k successful beyond uh, most galaxies out there 
the protagonist and the antagonist shifts depending on the faction that you choose. To someone that is a chaos faction player that loves the chaos faction, say for example the Death Guard, Gilliman is an antagonist, not a protagonist, because Gilliman is one of your greatest enemies. To an ultramarine player, the Death Guard is considered to be an enemy, and therefore Mortarian is going to be your antagonist. Uh, it, it, it's. I think personally, I think it's one of the 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 best things in the Warhammer universe is how every faction looks at all of the other factions as the antagonist, whereas their people are the protagonist to them. It's really cool, actually. Other three million men and women in this single deployment on this single world in this single battle will now show them the might of the God Emperor. That weapon in your hands has killed 99% of the alien populations in this galaxy. Unfortunately for you, soldier, you're fighting the final 1%. May the Emperor be with us. Glory to the first man to die, for in the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war. <laughs> wow. Wow. Oh, what a video. What a video. But yeah, like we discussed a few weeks ago, this is what you get when you have a universe that basically never forgot its roots. It, it, it is what it is, and it doesn't pretend to be anything else. It is war. Uh, Bricky was absolutely correct here in saying that the whole story is one of regression. There is no such thing as victory. There is no such thing as defeat. There is only the war. Will you suffer defeats? Will you gain victories? Yeah. But you'll gain victories of battles. You'll gain defeats of battles. But you will never win the war. It is just not possible. Because the war is never ending. Every planet, around every corner, there is another war. And I feel like looking at that, and looking at the success that Warhammer 40k, the increasing success that Warhammer 40k has been experiencing, proves, first and foremost, that age is not a reason for something to die. Because you hear it all the time, right? World of Warcraft is uh, doing badly because it's an old game and people are just bored? Well, how the fuck do you then explain all of those Warhammer fanboys that have been fanboys of Warhammer since the 80s. How, how, how the fuck do you explain that? Why are they not sick and tired of Warhammer, considering how old this universe is? In my estimation, it's because it's you know exactly what to expect when you get into the Warhammer universe. When you pick up a Warhammer book, you know exactly what you're going to get. You don't have to guess. You don't have to wonder if this is going to be the good book or if this is going to be this book or if that's... You know what you're going to get. And it's fun. It's just good, clean fun. So yeah. If you've never played a Warhammer game, if you've never watched a Warhammer video, if you've never read a Warhammer book, now may be the time to do so because this universe is about to pop off.